All right. Hey, welcome everybody to Entrepreneur Encounters. I'm Brent F. Walsh. I'm an entrepreneur coach and business catalyst. I want to welcome you to episode 20 of our Entrepreneur Encounters interviews. We have an amazing guest today, but before I get into that, I want to talk about why we do Entrepreneur Encounters at all. I believe that we have to know the stories of other entrepreneurs who are a little bit further along the journey than we are, understand some of how they succeeded and figure out how to pick up and learn some things along the way. This is not a solo journey. There are no self-made entrepreneurs. That is a total myth. Um, And so that's why I want you to meet our guest today. Today, we're going to have on Marcus Mueller, the owner of Skedaddle Humane Wildlife Control here in Milwaukee, and he's recently been able to expand and get a couple more trucks out in the Madison area. So I think you're going to find his story. I originally worked with Marcus back in all the way back in 2017, actually, um, when he was really focusing on getting started and, and doing some of the basics to get launched. And it's been a privilege to hear about his growth and how he's come along since then. So with that, Marcus, I want to welcome you to the show. Thanks, Brent. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Tell us about yourself and your business and what you guys do. Yeah, you bet. Um, so I, uh, I'm from Milwaukee, born and raised. I uh, grew up in West Dallas, New Berlin area. Um, my background has always been you know, rooted in an interest in wildlife. Um, so whether that was growing up as a kid um, or even when I got into high school, uh, college and whatnot, the focus was generally around wildlife. Uh, I proceed, pursued a wildlife biology degree at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. Um, worked through various uh, government jobs, local, state government, uh, wildlife research and technician jobs after college. Um, One of those jobs was actually working here in Milwaukee with the Wisconsin Humane Society's Wildlife Rehabilitation Center, which is where I really got an exposure to urban wildlife and the issues that uh, primarily homeowners uh, come across with them on on an almost daily basis. And it really kind of started this, this idea and even really this journey uh, for me to see how could I how could I get involved in that? How could I provide that type of service for people in um, really the, the place that I call home? So I, I went to, I, after a couple of those jobs, I ended up going to graduate school at UW-Madison for wildlife biology. Um, again, a program where I was focused a lot around uh, working with wildlife conflict situations. Um, and ultimately kind of had that conversation with myself in grad school about what did I want to do, uh, you know, when I grew up. And so I kind of got back to thinking about that experience I had at the rehabilitation center and and interacting with these people from Milwaukee who who were having issues with wildlife. Uh, They were reaching out to the Humane Society because they wanted it done in an ethical and humane way that, you know, had the best interest of the wildlife um, in mind. Um, And kind of started that that conversation with myself about okay how can I potentially provide this type of service um, again my, my my background was never in business or marketing or anything that's kind of related to the business world it was always in wildlife uh, so it was a really it was a really fun journey kind of learning more about that along the way but that's kind of where this whole journey started yeah so but why why entrepreneurship? Certainly, there were there were opportunities to maybe find another company to work for. You mentioned you'd had some experience with the Humane Society. Why did you decide to go ahead and say this is the time for me to figure out how to do it on my own and be my own boss? Uh, a couple different reasons. Um, one was being in grad school. That was a really research heavy position that I was in. And one of the things that I think I took away from graduate school is that I did not want to make a career out of doing research. Um, that, that, that's a big portion of a lot of wildlife related fields is that is that research component. And while I really enjoyed my time in grad school, what I really got from it, and what I really enjoyed was that interaction with the public, working with people who were having issues. And what I really wanted to do was, you know, explore that further um, as, as my career. So. I didn't want to go into the research side. Uh, There was, you know, for one reason or another, was less interested in kind of getting back into the government side of work. Um, And so I started to explore the possibility of the private sector. Um, And when I really did some research to see if folks were doing this type of work that I was really interested in, this more humane method of wildlife control, uh, there really wasn't a lot of companies out there who were doing it already. Um, so the, the seed was kind of planted and, you know, started to sprout a little bit that, hey, maybe this is an opportunity that I could go into something for myself um, and kind of build my own career, for, for lack of a better term, 
And I think it provided an awesome opportunity to really join up a lot of things that I really felt passionate about, but there wasn't a clear cut, get this job and you can do it for the rest of your life type of position out there already. Yeah. What do I do when I grow up? That's one of those. Uh, the answer is, I don't know, ask me tomorrow and I'll let you know what I'm going to do tomorrow. So um, walk us through what it took for you to get started. I know uh, this is a franchise that you picked up. So obviously there's a there's a franchise operator out there you had to interact with, learn about, um, and, and then get the funding to get launched. So tell us what it took to get started. Yeah, it was, I think, a combination of you know persistence on my part, but also just as much of being in the right place at the right time. Um, when I was kind of looking into seeing if, you know, there were other companies doing this sort of work, uh, I didn't come across any. Um, so it was kind of the, the idea of what would it take for me to do it myself, not having any business experience. Uh, I came across a, I came across Skedaddle's website and they were advertising for franchise opportunities. Um, again, not having that much business in, that much business experience for myself, that the idea of a franchise with an existing business model and kind of that structure to build around was really appealing. Um, so I reached out to their franchise coordinator and kind of got the ball rolling with some conversations. And really that first, that first conversation was nothing more than, you know, me looking for more information to potentially maybe get a job with them down the road, or if they had franchises in other areas around the country, maybe I could get a chance to work with them. Um, it wasn't even really surrounding the the idea of starting a franchise myself, but um, it happened pretty early on in grad school. So I wasn't really in a position to jump into anything yet. Um, at that point in time, this was probably around 2015, they had not launched any franchises in the United States. Um, so they were kind of getting everything ready to, to make that move, but hadn't yet done that. Um, and eventually those conversations persisted over the course of a year and a half, two years. And it worked out that you know, everything that they were able to offer from a structure support, the structure and support standpoint was exactly what I was looking for to really bolster the wildlife background that I had to turning this thing into a business. And so it was never, you know, it, it was a very short conversation in my mind in terms of deciding, do I want to go this alone and try to figure out my own way to do it? Or do I go with an existing franchise that kind of has the, the business side of things figured out a little bit to, to supplement the wildlife background that I have? Um, and so in, in the fall of 2017, we were able to launch the, the first United States franchise of Skedaddle uh, here in Milwaukee. And since then, we've opened up another franchise in the Madison area as well. So talk to me a little bit about, about budget and resources and maybe just touch really briefly on what, what, the, what the franchise gives you when you sign up there and then how you put together a budget to get started. Because because there it can be capital intensive, but you know, at some point you still have limited resources, particularly when you're launching. So walk us a little bit through that. I, I think the really appealing thing about this franchise in particular was the fact that there wasn't, there wasn't a huge capital investment to get started. Um, really, I could do everything out of one service van. Uh, the material costs for jobs were relatively small to start, just given my, my scale. Um, and it was really outside of that, that initial service van and some equipment, um, I was able to start generating revenue fairly quickly um, without having to invest in real estate or an office or staff or anything like that. I, I, I ran it all through the one service van and was able to do pretty much everything from sales to service to customer support all myself. Um, and so that really kept that initial, that initial investment down quite a bit. Um, as far as as far as the budgeting side of it goes, that was something. The, the one piece of advice I got, or one piece of advice I got early on, was if you're going to make a solid investment, do it in a good accountant. And uh, that was one of the best decisions that I made because, again, my background's in wildlife. I don't have the expertise. I, I still don't. I don't claim to be an expert by any means in that side of the business. Um, but I have a great team around me that really helps to support me from that side of things. And it, it, w without a doubt, I, I wouldn't be in the position I am right now, had I tried to do that myself or gone a different route with the accounting side. Yeah. So let's, so you started to build up some good outside support professional services. Walk us through, how did you decide when it was time to expand? Cause I know you obviously started with one truck. You're now up to, I believe six. Um, how did you decide to expand and then walk us through how it works, bringing on some new employees, because you've got a brand and an ethos and a style that, that wasn't, uh, 
that wasn't existing here in Milwaukee when you started? Right. Um, it was, I, I think the biggest thing that I learned throughout the whole process was how important this team was. And it's something that I, you know, maybe didn't have the greatest perspective on at first. Um, when all of the growth that we've had has really come very organically. Um, it's, you know, when, when I was in a truck by myself, when we started to get too many leads for me to keep up with both the inspections and the service is when I brought on a person to uh, help with the sales side of things. Um, when, he, when he started selling, you know, keeping up the sales to a point where I needed help on the service side, I brought in a technician assistant. Um, when, you know, his sales kept increasing and, you know, the, the word really started to, to spread about what, the, what type of services we, we offered. Um, we brought, brought on another technician and another technician assistant with that second service truck. Um, so really it was, it was more so, more so reactive growth in the first probably two, two and a half years where we were really just responding to the amount of leads and the work that was coming in. Can I, um, can I, can I pause you there for a second? Talk, uh, talk to me about how you generated those leads. A lot of businesses when we get started, You've got a lot of grand ideas about how you're going to do stuff and, and what's going to work. And sometimes you're throwing spaghetti against the wall. What, what worked for you? How did you generate those leads? Um, probably on a limited budget. Yeah. Um, one of the first things that, uh, in, in terms of the leads, a lot of them were driven initially by pay-per-click advertising and SEO work that was all handled through the corporate office of Skedaddle. Um, so again, re cycling back to the concept of having a good team, the support and the structure that they were able to provide from, from kind of that background side of things that, again, I didn't have much experience in, was absolutely instrumental to getting that ball rolling. I think just as important were some of the community connections that we either brought into the uh, business or, 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 or kind of built as we, as we went. Um, you know, local humane societies, wildlife rehabilitation centers, again, Reaching, thinking back to where, where all this whole thing started, um, organizations like wildlife rehabilitators and humane societies get calls about wildlife all the time. And there's often a conflict where, you know, you wanna help somebody and say, hey, you can call this person to, to do this type of work. But if there's not somebody who does it in a humane way that aligns with your mission to keep the benefit or the, the welfare of animals in the forefront of the operations, it's kind of tough to say, say with good faith that these, you know, this person may, may handle it in the way that you hope it would. Whereas now being able to have that relationship, they know exactly the type of service that we're going to provide. It's going to be focused on the animals. It's going to be focused on long-term solutions, things that's going to benefit both the homeowner and the wildlife. Um, building that kind of referral network was critical for us too, because now we have a, a, a lot of really great leads coming in from folks who are really interested in the welfare of the animals. And we can also you know, provide a service to those organizations too, that they don't have to spend hours on the phone talking to potential people about, uh, you know, how to do it themselves or giving them resources that, you know, takes away from their time doing their job of animal care um, at the centers. So between those two, those are probably my two biggest sources of leads in the beginning. And then after that, we've, we've explored some other advertising, um, having a vehicle that has, is wrapped with our logo, bright colors, always a fantastic opportunity to get leads that way. Um, I, I think, you know, we'll, Oftentimes when we're, when we're having a slow day here, um, it's, you know, go park the van in a, in a, in a shopping mall parking lot and have lunch there type of thing. And, you know, you get plenty of eyes out there and just happen to see that bright green van sitting in the parking lot can stir up some interest that way too. Sure. Sure. Well, that's, I, I think that makes a lot of sense and, and a value on your franchise operation that they're taking some of that investment you make and turn it around and pouring back in you so that you can, figure out how to hit the ground running. So I think that's, that's awesome. What have been some ways you've had to adapt as you've, as you have grown speaking to you as an entrepreneur and also your business? For me specifically, I think the biggest thing, at least the biggest challenge that I've had over the last three years is learning what my specific role is and knowing when I need to change that role. Um, so starting off, it was basically everything on my shoulders and, you know, trying to wear as many hats as I possibly could. And as we've grown over the last couple of years, it's really shifted into, okay, how can I put my team in a position to be successful? Um, from assembling the team to supporting the team, training, everything like that. It's very much shifted my role. And admittedly, that's been a really hard shift for me, just knowing how invested I, I am and 
how I was at the beginning where I had the, I had the flexibility and the control to have everything done, you know, my way essentially to learning how to effectively delegate and put people, like I said, in, in positions to be successful without micromanaging them and trying to be as, as hands-on as maybe I would be if I were doing this job myself. Um, really learning how to be an effective manager has been a really big challenge, but an even bigger opportunity for me and, and the business as, as a whole. And I think, I, not to sound too self-serving about it, but I think it, it, the better I can do to learn how to be a better manager, that's what's going to really help to, to grow the team because, or to grow the business, because that'll be what essentially lets the team do what they're best at. Right. What, uh, talk to me about some obstacles that maybe you encountered along the way, whether it was in the hiring process, retention uh, from the employee side, and even the idea of expanding to other markets. Like what obstacles have you run into and had to overcome? Um, I think the, from the team perspective, it was definitely a learning, a learning curve to really understand the hiring process and what exactly I was looking for and what we needed on, in our team. Uh, learning how to identify holes that we have and filling them with the right people or bringing people on with the right mindset that, you know, maybe, maybe they don't have all the skills, the, the hard skills that you need, but they've got the greatest attitude and work ethic to, to really push forward and learn those skills. Um, it, it, it's definitely been a learning, uh, a learning process to figure out exactly how to build a team and maybe even more so to support a team. Um, and I'm really, really excited about the team that we have here in Milwaukee and Madison now. And I think because, because there has been growth in the team aspect of Skedaddle, um, that's why we've really seen the, the growth as a business as a whole. Um, as far as expansion goes, uh, it was definitely a, a, a different challenge expanding into Madison. Um, it's a new area, new clients, new marketing. Um, I kind of went into it thinking that all right, they've, you know, they've got humane societies out there. They've got wildlife rehabilitators. It'll be pretty much a cookie cutter like it was Milwaukee. And it was very much not that. Um, it's, it's, you know, learning how to adapt to a new market and what works here doesn't necessarily work there. And I'm still, I'm still spending the majority of my time in Milwaukee. And so having a lot of those upstart or those, the, the kind of startup responsibilities delegated to my team out in Madison was a big, a big shift for me. But, um, Again, it's I can't I can't speak highly enough of the team that I have in place because they've really embraced that opportunity and have done some really great things with it. I think you bring up some great points. Uh, you know, even though it seems like going to an adjacent market, Madison's not that far from Milwaukee. Um, you know, arguably you might even have some infrastructure more established from a humane care of uh, wildlife, uh, being closer to the DNR and that type of thing. However. The cookie cutter doesn't always work and you, you uh, sounds like you had to adapt quickly on the fly. And I think that's an important, that's an important lesson for anyone is that, you know, try what you know, but be ready to move into something else quickly if you have to. So um, what do you do to stay on top of your industry? I got to imagine this is an industry that's getting new ideas, new suggestions. Um, there are probably some like-minded individuals, maybe getting information from the franchise operator themselves or franchise owner themselves. So what, what do you do to stay on top of your game? Uh, I think one of the biggest things is just really focusing on what sets us apart from the other wildlife control companies out there. Um, particularly, we don't do any sort of trapping and relocating. Um, our style of removal, <clears throat> excuse me, is very different in that we are removing the animals from the house using either a hands-on approach or a one-way door system that we've designed on a very species by species and situation by situation basis. Um, and then we're doing the exclusion work around the home to make sure that they can't get back in elsewhere, ultimately trying to build a wildlife proof house. And this style is something that isn't, it, it's certainly not easy. It's very labor intensive and very knowledge intensive to understand, okay, if one animal's trying to get in here, the next spot they'll try to get in is over here and then over here. And that can be applied to just about any situation out there. Um, so it's, it's a unique, challenging way to do the work we do but it is very unique in, in comparison to the other ways, the more traditional uh, approaches to wildlife control out there. And so that really does set us apart. And I think being able to continue to hone our craft in that side of it and really focus on the things that we are very good at rather than try to continue to expand to other services has really kind of helped us stay on top of that aspect of the market. And you know, people have responded really well to it. What's one of the most unusual 
uh, animals you've been called on to uh, figure out how to mitigate and control? You know, we don't really get, we haven't got too many unusual animals, but it's, it's more so the situations they find themselves in, whether it's a, a raccoon that's tucked itself up under the floorboards. Um, we've gotten skunks out of poured concrete porches on the east side that the only entrance is about a one foot by one foot hole that you got to go into to, to see what's going on underneath there. Um, it, it's always something new and honestly is one of the most rewarding things about the job for, for everybody involved is, you know, you, you think you have a, an idea of what's going on going into a situation, but there's always that little chance that something's going to go differently than you planned. And it really keeps everybody on their toes and keeps everything exciting for the jobs that we're doing. Yeah, it's, that's really interesting to think that it's actually the, the scene and the setting that maybe drives the variability and, the, and to some degree the expertise needed. How do you train your staff to have that level? Because that's a lot of creative thinking that you're going to need to have. There's a lot of problem solving skills. Um, how do you recruit and train staff for that? Because that's an attribute a lot of entrepreneurs would love to have on their team. I'm, I assure you that. Without a doubt. Um, it's, it's definitely something that is, is hard to find. Um, but really that's, I, I was told very early on to hire the personality and tra train the skills. And it's something that I've tried to focus on in my hiring process and training process. But the franchise does a great job of providing a lot of really nice structured training modules and online resources to get everybody in exposure to all sorts of um, different scenarios and species and setups that we'll, we'll see out in the field. Um, one big boost to our training program that we've uh, been building up over the last year or so was in January of last year, we did move into a small warehouse in West Dallas. And here we were able to set up a, a hands-on in-person training center where we have model setups of roofs and different venting styles that we see, different areas of a home that we'd see wildlife getting into. So we can always take a really hands-on deep dive into very specific situations that we may see so that when a technician does get out to the field, they can take those repeatable skills that they learned in a very controlled setting and apply them to the you know, potentially different situation they'll see out there, but have that knowledge and that baseline understanding of kind of what to expect. And that, that has honestly been a huge benefit to, you know, to me feeling comfortable and, and uh, feeling as though the technicians are equipped with the knowledge they need. Um, but also from their perspective, you know, we've had a lot less, or we've had a lot more confidence from, from the technician side going into the field in these different situations. And really our, our ramp up and our training schedule, the time that it takes to get a technician from hired to uh, fully trained has drastically uh, reduced because of it. Oh, that's amazing. Tell me about, uh, tell me about funding. You've, you've uh, you talked a little bit about what it took to get started. You've obviously grown um, investing in trucks and, and you'll need the additional equipment, et cetera, in order to make these field field modifications to make the houses wildlife secure. So how do you develop the funding? How do you get the funding? What type of methods have you used in order to, to allow your expansion to be successful? So I was, I admittedly was very fortunate to have a, a family member who really believed in, you know, in me, in the business and was very interested in, in helping me out from the jump and provided me with a small loan to be able to, to get that first truck and, and get it wrapped and get things off the ground. Um, but honestly, from there, it was genuine, generating enough revenue to just keep growing organically. And because we, because we grew that way, there was never a point where it, you know, I felt that we needed to incur additional debt or, you know, take out an expansion loan or anything like that, that really, you know, set us back at all. It was, it, it really was organic growth from, from the jump. And, you know, I, I, I credit that to, a great business model provided by the franchise, um, some really great partners here in Milwaukee who've made this ramping up process and the expansion of Madison uh, a lot smoother than I thought it could be. Um, but really it's, it's, it's that organic growth and just kind of keeping track of finances and, and, and planning for future opportunities for growth with the existing cash on hand. Yeah. So uh, if we look at your vehicles, which are probably your single point uh, large investments, did you decide to lease? Did you buy outright? Did you find used? Like what What was the model that worked well for you? Uh, a little of both. Um, so my service vans are all leased, but there are some other vehicles in the fleet that aren't as specialized as the, as the completely uh, rigged up vans that we did purchase used and, and went at that independently. Yeah. I mean, I think... 
I think one of the challenges we come up with when there's a large dollar capital item, what are some creative ways you can do it? Um, and it sounds like you went with a, a little of both. I don't know if in this this time used is is the best option just because that market's tight, but that's an example of where you have to pivot, where you have to figure it out. Um, talk to me. You've talked about your brand a little bit. Um, what what do you want us to know about your brand? What is uniquely you that your customers really gravitate to and has made you successful? For Skedaddle, it's it's the long term approach. Um, the I think that's the the common thread for just about anybody who's looking for wildlife control services. That is a really big draw to the services that we have to offer. Um, of course, the the it, the name's right in the t- the titles in the name that we are a humane wildlife control com- company that put a lot of priority in making sure that animals are unharmed, they're released on site. They, if there's a family unit involved, all the family unit stays together, mom and all of her babies. Um, so the humane side really uh, attracts a lot of potential clients. Um, but that long-term, that long-term solution that we back up with a lifetime guarantee for all the work that we do um, is really that common thread that you know any anybody looking for wildlife control wants it done from a long-term perspective. And that's something that I think what we are able to offer is almost unmatched from, from any other company out there. Awesome. You started to get into your support network a little bit. You talked about finding an amazing accountant. You've, you've referenced some other resources that you use. Um, I know I had the privilege of working with you in the very beginning. Talk to me about your support network and, and what it's meant to you in terms of being able to develop and grow and succeed. Um, as I've, as I've, taken on responsibilities that are less in my own wheelhouse, um, it's become more and more important. Um, so when I was first starting up, it was really easy to, for me to kind of rely on my own skills as far as the, the wildlife side of things went, the, the construction background or the construction style work and working outside. It was all things that I was really familiar with. But as I've moved into more of this management role, I've really needed to kind of hone in on what are these support systems around me and you know how can i how can i take advantage of of that resource to to better you know the business and so whether that's you know reaching out to more established businesses for advice or um co- consultations from other entrepreneurs on you know handling team building or sales or all of these different aspects of growing the business that you know i'm, I'm slowly but surely kind of working my way into um i think that's where I'm at right now has been kind of eye-opening to how much there still is to learn. And so for me, it's getting over that hurdle of, all right, let's not just try to figure it out yourself. There are people who know what they're doing. There's people who are really good at this that we can learn from to start to uh, kind of flatten out that learning curve just a bit. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, getting established with people, I like what you said, when you got outside your, your area of expertise, that's really a time when it's super important for us, us as entrepreneurs to start leaning on other people who do have some of that expertise. And I think you'll find people are willing to share it. How have you persevered to stay in business? Uh, and, and what made you decide to persevere? Because I'm sure there were some tough moments along the way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, there's, there's, there was a lot of times in the beginning when you know I was still really trying to kind of find my stride and learn, you know, the, the time management side of it, the the accountability side when there's not someone who's you know setting deadlines and looking over your shoulder, um, I, you know there there were a lot of times where it felt like you know I'd come home at the end of the day and say to my wife I I really wish someone would have just told me what to do today where I could just punch in punch out and have someone to help, tell me what to do all day, um, but honestly as as we've been able to grow and put a team in place that seemingly is moving us in the right direction rather than a team that either wasn't assembled properly or I was not an effective manager for. Um, anytime that that's, anytime that we have a, an experience or a team in place that, you know, you kind of get that feeling of, all right, something's going right here. Um, it, it's kind of that reminder, that little, that little spark that says, all right, this was a good decision to, to go into business for yourself. Um, couple that with the time flexibility. Um, So my wife and I had a, had a child in 2020 and we've got another one on the way and having the time flexibility to make up for, make up doctor appointments at, you know, a random 10 o'clock on a Tuesday or, or things like that. Um, You know, it's time, time flexibility has always been really important to me and, you know, kind of gets reinvigorated now that 
little ones are in the picture, but um, that's, a, that's been a big motivator for me, just strictly from an entrepreneur perspective to, you know, remind me one of the reasons why uh, I'm, I'm in business for myself. Awesome. Well, I got to tell you, um, entrepreneurs working on perseverance and figuring out how to make it work even in tough times, um, it does help to have some of those offsetting benefits, but I think it's one of the key attributes that makes uh, entrepreneurs stand apart from anyone else. If you don't have perseverance, uh, you're not going to make it. This is this is a long game that everyone's playing. So if folks want to get a hold of you, they want to learn more about Skedaddle, what are the best ways for them to get in touch with you? Uh, our website's a great resource, skedaddlewildlife.com. Otherwise, um, I'm always happy to, to talk to folks about what we've got going on here in Milwaukee and Madison. Uh, my contact information is Marcus Mueller at skedaddlewildlife.com. Um, also can be found on our website as well. Great. Hey, today we've been having a conversation with Marcus Mueller, owner and franchisee of Skedaddle Humane Wildlife Control. Uh, if, you, if you can, I'm sure you can come up with opportunities where you're going to need his services. So do keep him in mind. And I hope you learn some things from him. Pieces that stood out to me were really the value he was able to get from being a franchisee and, and leveraging his relationship with that franchise owner in order to be successful. Hey, look, we cannot be successful on our own. I think this story told that somewhat. If you're looking to continue building your support network, find a spot where you can share with other entrepreneurs. I wanna invite you to join us Wednesdays, 4.30 Central. Uh, you can, uh, we have groups of entrepreneurs coming together, sharing their struggles, sharing their opportunities, sharing their successes, celebrating wins together. Do take that opportunity to build it. This is a free opportunity. It's bit.ly, bit.ly slash entrepreneur encounters. Sign up and get on the email list so that we can make sure to get you the information for that. Uh, I can't do this alone either. I've got sponsors who've helped me along the way. Andrew Feller Photography has done all of our photography work, both here and on our website. Buckethead Creative handles our graphics. Charlie's Music Factory and Chris Crane do our music on the way out. And Milwaukee Web Designs has helped us with our web presence. So again, if I can help you in any way, uh, my name is Brent Taff Wasson. I'm a business coach and entrepreneur, and I want to help entrepreneurs and owners grow their profit and accelerate their business. If I can help you, please go ahead and reach out to me, bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash coach with Brent. Set up some time. Let's have an initial discussion and figure out if there's a great way I can serve you. So again, thanks for joining us on Entrepreneur Encounters. If you like what you heard, please do reach out and subscribe and check out some of our other long form content. Come on.